So, um, hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, and today's webinar topic is implementing web UI on NXP IMX RT1020 crossover microcontrollers. Um, and I probably give like a couple of seconds more for people to join because I, I I see that like a lot of people joining in the last couple of seconds. So uh, I'll give like maybe five, 10 seconds more. So uh, on today's webinar, it's a joint webinar between Cezanta and uh, NXP. Uh, and my name is Sergey. I represent Cezanta. Uh, and here I, uh, I have a co-host, uh, Michael Susan from NXP. Uh, Mike is a, a product and requirements manager uh, at NXP. And um, he will talk briefly about, about NXP hardware. So, uh, and I guess said that uh, I will uh, pass over to Mike. So he'll he'll uh, he'll explain and describe the uh, the hardware part of things. So let me stop sharing, and I let Mike speak now. So over to you, Mike. Okay, thank you. So uh, I can see that I'm sharing right now. Hope you all see my screen. And it's. As Sergey mentioned, I'm product and requirements manager in, here in uh, NXP. I'm focusing on the graphics and touch sensing on the MCUs and all, also on the MPU. So I'm covering both worlds, let's say, but we are not dividing them. There is no wall between MCU and MPU. I will, I will show you. So uh, here is our portfolio. You can see uh, it is, let's say, divided or there are three groups. MCUs, crossovers, and application processors in MCUs. We have LPC, Kinetis, and MCX. This is new family. <clears throat> and inside the MCX family, there is, or there, there are the subfamilies like MCX A and L and W for wireless. These uh, uh, MCUs are mainly used in appliances, but if we move uh, with the performance and functional integration, let's say higher, uh, we are using crossovers, the IMX RT, and let's say part of the IMX ULP, I mean, IMX 6 ULP 7 and 8, but uh, these IMX, peak IMX devices are mainly uh, grouped in the group of application processors. So crossovers are, let's say, MCUs combining the advantages of both worlds, MCUs and MPUs. And of course, application processors, there are the there are the families of IMX, 6, 7, and 8, and also later scape for uh for uh, connectivity and let's say for the wired connectivity. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the uh, our portfolio. Uh, as I mentioned, we have IMX and uh, MCUs. Well, the MCUs, we are called the, the IMX devices, we call it the MPUs and MCUs as a basic. So uh, IMX devices are running on the A cores. Also, they can be combined uh, with the Cortex M cores. You can uh, run the application or the low level things on the M core and then the Linux, Android uh, or Android Auto on the, on the A cores. Uh, we have the, the portfolio of the Amix uh, devices are pretty wide, so we can offer from 600 megahertz up to 2 gigahertz of, of performance. Also, the rich, there is a rich HDMI experience. You can connect multiple displays with resolution up to 4K. And as I mentioned, there are uh, Linux and Android running mainly open source, but we have partners that are serving, uh, let's say, paid variants of the operating systems. Uh, on the other side, there is uh, the MCU portfolio. So the MCU portfolio runs on the Cortex-M, mainly M0, M1, M3, 33, and M4. The performance is up to 300 megahertz. It has embedded memory, and there, uh, we, we are serving the tools for flashing, debugging, everything. So it's easy to start with uh, the, the MCUs. Uh, okay, let's talk about the IMX RT. IMX RT family, these are our crossovers, MCUs. It's still MCUs. There is no way how to run Linux on that or Android. It's still MCUs. 
but uh, it integrates, for example, ARM Cortex M cores, I mean M7, which are the most powerful. So we can offer you offer to you up to one gigahertz of performance. For example, IMX RT1170 can run up to one gigahertz. So it's pretty, pretty huge for just MCU. Okay. We are offering also the partner software. And I think, or I think that's the reason why we are now here to talk more about IMX RT, especially about IMX RT 1020. Uh, here's the summary of our, uh, portfolio or the, let's say MCU portfolio because we have still uh, the MCUs and we are counting also with the IMXRT. So we can offer to IMXRT, as I mentioned, Kinetis K as also LPC. Uh, let's say that we have two families, the Kinetis, which comes from originally, which, which come from, uh, comes from Freescale and also LPC, which originally comes from uh, NXP and uh, now let's say we, let's say tied these together and that's the reason why we are uh, offering MCXN family, which combines both, let's say. Okay, uh, the second or the last slide is about uh, just our values. So uh, our values is the product innovation. So we can offer the high performance crossover processors also as a low power and secure connected MCUs. Uh, we have expansive ecosystem, we have a lot of partners for graphics, for connectivity, for, let's say, for hardware, of course. So we have our uh, partner network is uh, very large, let's say very wide. And uh, we have also customer driven commitment. So we can, uh, our, our internal policies are like the product quality, longevity and support for uh, uh, 10 thousands and customers across thousands of diverse applications. So. We are selling a lot of, lot of these uh, MCUs and RTs. And that's all from my side. I will stop sharing here and I will give my word to, to Sergey. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thanks, Emily, and thanks for the uh, great presentation. So uh, let me continue on. Um, and it, so the agenda for today's webinar will be the hardware overview, which Mike already uh, already did. Um, so I want to make this talk like a, a combination of a, a, some theoretical general uh, principles and knowledge that, could, that are applicable uh, pretty much universally and a very hands-on session. So the, uh, uh, at the end, uh, at the second part of, of the talk, I want to uh, uh, like show on a real, on a real development board on this RT201020 uh, uh, you know, the, the, the real application of the principles of which I'll be talking about right now. So uh, I'll be talking first about the TCP IP stack, generally how it works, then about the UI uh, architecture, uh, the web UI architecture, uh, then the uh, suggested, uh, uh, the uh, suggested project structure that we think is good. Um, and then, and then uh, I'll go on the uh, on the hands-on uh, workshop on the on the real device. So uh, during the presentation, I encourage you to ask questions if you have any. So there should be a button on the on the UI said like Q and A. So please go type questions there, and a uh, during the presentation, I'll 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 keep keep a, a looking at those, and I will answer those either during uh, during the presentation or somewhere somewhere uh, sometimes later so um now uh let me let me proceed so first of all i want to talk like just to give a, a short intro about myself so you know who who uh, who talks to you so who's who's that dude so my name is sergey and i'm an engineering director at Cezanta. Cezanta is a software development company uh, founded in Dublin 10 years ago, and we do uh, uh, software for embedded devices, uh, networking software. That's our bread and butter. So we do software for uh, for connected devices. Our main product is Mongoose Library, which is a, a, which I'm going to use later on in this presentation. So uh, I am also the author of the Bare Metal Programming Guide. So if you look uh, at the uh, GitHub search for bare metal programming guide, there are a couple of them, but the one with the 2000 stars is the one, right? So if you are, a, especially if you are a, a, a beginner 
uh, embedded engineer, embedded firmware engineer, I highly encourage you to go and to study this guide because it goes and explains everything from the ground up. So, uh, uh, I, and I'm the original author of the Mongoose library, the main product uh, of Cezanta. Uh, and I'm also a frequent speaker of various conferences like Embedded World and so on. So on this webinar, what I want to do is to share some experience that we gained over the uh, uh, last years. So. Uh, participating in lots of uh, integration projects with our customers, uh, 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 implementing specifically implementing web UIs, device dashboards on various microcontrollers. So, uh, so we've built up a, a bunch of uh, best practices. So, I want to share them with you today. So, uh, uh, I hope that it will be useful and uh, and that it will save a lot of time and effort during uh, during a uh, your um, your work. And for some of them, probably it will help with with your with your future career. So, uh, said that, let me continue on, and then we and we we start here with the uh, overview of the TCP/IP stack, how it works, right? So, uh, so uh, the TCP IP stack on any device, not just embedded device, on any device, on your phone, on your workstation, uh, is implemented in layers. So when two devices co communicate between e uh, with each other, they exchange the information in short packets. It's not like a continuous stream of bytes. It's a, it's a stream of short pieces of information called, called frames. Right, so, uh, and basically uh, two devices exchange frames. And when a, an embedded device uh, receives a frame, the, every frame is processed um, uh, uh, by a, a layers of software. And there are four layers, right, a, uh, on top of each other. The first, the very first layer uh, is called a driver layer. So that driver layer, uh, it, it's kind of the most low one, the low level one. Uh, its task is just to read the frame from the hardware. So that's its task. It just reads the frame. So on the diagram here, it's just a, a, a function called receive frame, something like that. Driver doesn't know what that frame is. It just receives a bunch of bytes. So that's that's what it is. And then it passes it on onto the upper layer. So the passage of the information between two layers it's usually implemented through the, uh, the function calls, right? So uh, uh, one layer calls a function of another layer and the set of functions that each layer implements, it forms the API of that layer, right? So in this case, the driver receives a frame. So it gets the bunch of data, a frame, and then it calls a function that is exported by the next layer, the, set of the layer number two, which is called the TCP IP stack layer. So, uh, and that that function is usually called like Ethernet input or something like that. So uh, this way it passes on the frame to the uh, to the TCP IP stack. TCP IP stack, it goes and parses the frame. So uh, usually the frame, it consists of like a bunch of the protocol headers at the beginning of the frame, which uh, which are followed by the data, right? So in this example, I, I, I explain the life of a frame. So imagine you you have a, like a, an HTTP request from a, a browser to your device asking for index HTML. So that's kind of like the frame that we received, right? So in this case, TCP IP stack parses the frame. Uh, uh, so it detects a, a, a Ethernet header with MAC addresses, then IP header followed by TCP header, and then goes data. So uh, uh, TCP IP stack parses that, it just extracts the data piece of it and passes on to the next layer, which is a library layer. So in this case, the, uh, the data piece of a frame, it, it contains the, the HTTP request, like get slash or get slash index HTML, HTTP 1.0, whatever. So HTTP library layer, it parses that piece of data, like HTTP request, uh, and it uh, prepares the, you know, usually it's event based. So it prepares the event with parsed request and passes it on to the application layer saying, hey, application, 
uh, you've got HTTP request uh, to this URI with these headers, do something about that. And, and uh, application layer then it goes decide, you know, the application logic decides what to do with this request. So in our case, let's assume that uh, we just read the index HTML content uh, and the application layer reads that and says, hey, okay, um, I this is the index HTML. So it talks to the uh, uh, to the library layer saying, hey, HTTP library, that's good. That's index HTML, go ahead and send the response. So the HTTP library gets the content of index HTML. It then uh, wraps it into a valid HTTP message, uh, or HTTP response, and passes on to the uh, second layer, TCP IP stack, saying, hey, go ahead and send that piece of data. So TCP IP stack appends the uh, uh, the necessary headers, TCP, IP, uh, Ethernet headers, and passes the that frame to the uh, driver layer saying, hey, driver, that's your frame, go ahead and send it. And the driver layer sends it back, and that's that's the way we get the, uh, <clears throat> the response. So that's a quick overview about how TCP IP stack works. Uh, and as you can see, it's a bit different from uh, from the seven seven uh, o -O -O OC layers that we used to see in the textbooks. So uh, and and that's that's basically that the way it it's it it works pretty much on on implementation in reality on all on all implementations. So. Um, um, and there are many uh, uh, many implementations of this software stack, right? So uh, these four layers, uh, there are dozens of them. So uh, I, I won't I won't talk about all of them. I'll just mention a few. So uh, one pretty well known implementation is the uh, MCU Espresso, which which provides uh, two lower layers uh, and a. So it doesn't provide the library layer. So it 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 it, um, it provides a bunch of examples. So people usually get examples and and build an application based on examples. So making an ad hoc kind of a library layer. So another popular one is the is Kyle from ARM. So they also provide a driver. They provide their own TCP IP stack. Uh, they also let users to just you know they do not provide a dedicated library layer. Um, and, and users usually just go and search for examples either in the SDK or they just search internet for some examples. They modify the example for their needs. Uh, and the other one uh, I want to know uh, to mention is a our own software, Mongoose Library, which provides all three layers in one single file. So it's basically uh, if you use Mongoose, you don't need uh, uh, much software. It's just one one file, well, two files, a C and, and, a, a, and a header file. So um, that's a quick overview how the TCP IP stack works. Uh, and now I'll, I'll probably uh, uh, just say a couple of words how the web UI application is usually constructed. So when we have a browser and uh, the uh, a device that implements any sort of like web UI, usually it's a device dashboard. So the best way to build an application is that the application should have like a two, you know, uh, um, two side structure. So one, one is the static files. So uh, the UI itself, the representation of web UI, it should be made by the, uh, by the static, static UI. So a set of the set of HTML, CSS, images, and JavaScript files. So, and, and when a browser makes the request, device responds with the static content. And then the static content, when it's downloaded by the browser, it usually starts making the dynamic request. So JavaScript files on the, on the browser start to make a, a RESTful API calls to the, uh, to the backend saying, okay, I've got my UI loaded. Now, like, hey, device, give me the information about your current state. Uh, so it, it makes a bunch of uh, uh, RESTful calls and then it renders the UI. So that's the way uh, 
basically all modern uh, web application web applications work, not just based on a device, even on on web, right? So that's the way it works. First, uh, first you load the static content, and then the static content uh, starts to make dynamic requests. So, and that also what we recommend to do. There are plenty of ways to uh, to uh, you know architecture the web UI, but that, uh, in our opinion, works the best because it separates the representation from the from the logic, right? So, because uh, a, a firmware developer can concentrate on on implementing a RESTful API on a device side without even thinking how it's going to look like on the UI, right? So. Um, and uh, so, uh, and in terms of the code, uh, it reflects in in the separation. So uh, the firmware is divided into two parts. The first one is the backend, and the second part is the front end. Um, and over the years, the best practice that we found is that we always implement the whole web UI in one single file. So the whole implementation gets into one single file so we usually we use mongoose as mongoose library uh, as our networking engine so the implementation goes usually in a file called net net.c net.h uh, and we abstract all hardware calls so uh, uh, and then we implement front end separately uh, so again a, a our best practice is to use peer react as a javascript framework and a Tailwind CSS as a CSS framework. The reason is these both frameworks are really small. Uh, you know, they are really professional, professionally looking. Um, so, and they are optimized in size. So they take like really small space on, on a device itself, right? Um, and a, probably now I'll, I'll tell like the, the biggest, uh, the biggest best practice that saved us uh, and other uh, uh, other companies a lot of time, just huge amount of time. So we do all development on the workstation, right? On the workstation. So uh, the workstation being like Windows, Linux, Mac, it provides a, a, all the tool sets to make the development really fast and easy. Uh, and Mongo's library being cross-platform, it provides the same API on any embedded uh, system and on the workstation. So then we just go and rebuild the built UI on the embedded system without making any changes, just, uh, just re-implementing the hardware mocks. So this whole thing, uh, this, this principle, uh, it saves a huge amount of time. So basically, and, and gives a lot of benefits too. So this way you build your kind of device emulator on the on the workstation and you can you can share it with other people you can easily make changes uh it's really easy to debug and develop um and and then uh, uh you basically just yeah rebuild the uh, the UI on the uh, on the embedded device i'm going to um demonstrate that later on on the this hands on session you'll see exactly how it works in reality so it's not just uh, you know just just theory it's it's a practice so uh, and then the web ui uh, the ui files itself uh, what we do we usually compile them inside the binary so um there are multiple ways of dealing with the static files uh, uh, one obvious way is to uh, just keep the static files on the file system but we prefer not to, we prefer to embed the UI into the binary. So we use like a, a simple utility for that. It, it works kind of like XXD. It just transforms a bunch of files into a, a sequence of the C uh, arrays. And we just add that a, a file, which is usually called packedfs.c to the compilation. So this way uh, we, you know, we make the UI resilient uh, to any file system uh, issues, and we are not dependent on the file system at all. So basically, if your device does not have any file system, uh, the UI will still work. So um, this is a, another uh, a best practice that we recommend to do. So uh, embedding the static files into the binary. Uh, another benefit it brings uh, that um, 
uh, the UI is always in sync with the code, right? So uh, imagine that you, you have like a file system and the, the file system keeps the static files. So it may happen that you can update the code or you can update the UI uh, and the code uh, uh, with the UI files with the static content can get out of sync. So, and obviously the UI will stop working. If you embed everything into the binary, it will never happen. So every time you do firmware uh, over the air update, it will update both things. So, and they will be guaranteed to be in sync. So uh, now I guess uh, I will jump into the, um, uh, into the hands-on session. I will be using Mongo's library, our own product to demonstrate how, how these general principles that I talked about work in reality. So uh, Mongo's library is, again, uh, our product is an open source library. Uh, it's on GitHub. Uh, you can take a look. It's like about 10,000 stars. It's pretty mature uh, product. Uh, it's been on the market since 2004, used by thousands of different companies. It's used, one of the customers is NASA. It works, uh, the Mongo's works on International Space Station. Um, it has a a really good documentation on mongoose.ws. If you go, go to the documentation, a really nice user guide with uh, explanations about everything, a lot of tutorials, examples for various, uh, uh, various hardware and so on, and a great API reference. So, uh, and a, uh, uh, and it's really easy to integrate. It's just two files, mongoose.c and mongoose.h. So you copy these two files to your to your uh, uh, firmware code, and that's it. It gives you the networking engine. And, and again, you'll see that uh, in in the hands-on session, which which I'm starting like soon. Um, and, and yeah, so said that the result will be something like this. So uh, this is a, an example dashboard library. So uh, as you can see, the result is a really sleek, uh, professionally looking uh, uh, web UI um, that works on, a, you know, works pretty much uh, everywhere uh, uh, from the workstation down to the really small microcontrollers with uh, with really low resources. So uh, said that, uh, I want to j now jump into the um, ju jump into the workshop, into the uh, hands-on workshop. So to do that, I'll stop the sharing of my uh, presentation, and I want to share the whole the whole desktop with you, right? So I'm sharing now the whole desktop. So I want you to uh, to see everything that I have here. So I have the development board. So this is our T1020 from NXP. So it's connected to my workstation through this uh, USB cable um, and to the ethernet, uh, uh, to, to the network, to the local network through this ethernet cable, right? So this is a, yeah, our T1020. I have a terminal here. Uh, so uh, I have a IDE. This is a VS code with a MCU Espresso plugin installed. So uh, it's empty, no projects here. So, uh, and that's pretty much it. So uh, my goal here is to, uh, first is to create a really basic uh, a bare metal project, uh, which will just, you know, print debug messages every so often on the, uh, on the terminal. So, uh, and then having this really baseline, uh, kind of, uh, project, we will add the, uh, networking functionality. We will add the uh, web UI on top of it. And, and again, so it, it'll be based on the, uh, Enet example, like a bare metal Enet example from uh, from MCU Espresso SDK, um, but uh, but said so, it, it will be like the the whole process will be applicable to uh, other uh, other environments, like for Azure TOS, FreeRTOS based Linux, and so on. Uh, the bare metal one is probably the most kind of complex and and basic and. Uh, by showing you uh, the bare metal approach, I'll show how easy it is 
And so on other environments, it will be even easier, right? So uh, now let me start. Again, what I want to do is first to start with a real, really simple uh, uh, application that just prints messages, debug messages on the on the console. So uh, I'll start with importing projects. Uh, so uh, for the RT ten twenty. So and, and the uh, uh, base project I want to uh, to use is the Enet example. So a driver example, ENET TX RX, uh, RX transfer. So um, let me give it a name. So P9, something like this. So I'll create the project called P9, uh, which is the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the driver, the ENET driver example, right? So, uh, but from this from this example, if I open the uh, 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 this example, what we're gonna use? We're gonna use just the uh, pin initialization. So the uh, 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 the whole functionality, the driver, the network driver, is inside Mongo's library. We will we will use only a pin in it uh, from from this project. But let me let me go and like and start. So. Uh, uh, for this project, uh, first let me change the build configuration. So we'll be using Flex SPI nor debug uh, to uh, basically flash flash this project on the flash, not in in RAM. Uh, the other thing that I want to make the quick change is I want to let me expand this a little bit. So uh, in launch.json, I want to remove this main we don't want the breakpoints i don't want the uh the uh, id to stop uh, uh and then a, another quick thing i want to open the uh, linker file uh and change the maximum heap size and stack size so i open flex spi nor ld uh, and this is the linker file and this linker file specifies the heap size of uh, yeah, I think it's something like 2K. So I want to change it to the, the heap size to 20, 32K and stack size to 4K. So that's that's the changes I want to make. And now let me uh, just go and uh, build it. So, uh, all right, so we have this uh, built and, 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 and flash it on the microcontroller. So uh, and to do that, oh, I I want to also start the um, uh, the uh, terminal program to see the output on the on the serial console. So cu minus l dev uh, cu usb and minus speed one five two hundred so something like this. All right, so. Um, but I think before that, before like running uh, on the uh, on the real uh, hardware, what I want to do, I want to um, build the UI example on the um, uh, on the workstation, right? So uh, let me do that first. So uh, I'll create another terminal. I'll go to the uh, Mongoose library on the GitHub, and let me just clone it here. Uh, Clone this library. So I just copy this, go to, this is my home directory and I just do git clone and I copy this uh, library just directly in my home directory. So then I go to mongoose examples device dashboard. I type make and I think uh, uh, I have the local so yeah, I have the local a uh, example with the device dashboard running on my workstation, right? So uh, I can log in as an admin admin and see. So this is an example device dashboard running on my workstation. And as I said previously uh, about the best practices of development, we usually develop the UI on the workstation. So uh, this is an example of the... Uh, um, uh, of such development, so and I'll be using the uh, the same UI on the on the embedded device, right? So uh, I'll I'll transfer this UI to the embedded device, 
right? So uh, let me stop this. Uh, uh, oh, but look, let, 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 let it run. Let it run. So um, let me see if the uh, if the example is actually uh, running on the device. So refreshing probes currently in progress. Let me see. So this is. debug probes. So uh, let me click on refreshing probes and click on the uh, on the flashing button again. Okay, so the thing gets flashed. I, I see this the uh, the uh, yeah, the, the LED is blinking, and now I see the output on the device saying that you know it, it it does something. So we see a frame is received. So this is the output from this a pre-built example from NXP uh, that shows us the you know how this uh, driver example works. So this driver example, uh, what it does, it first it initializes Ethernet pins, uh, then it goes this section it, it basically uh uh just resets the enet a microcontroller on on this device uh then mdo uh, uh mdio in it it just uh, sets up the clock of it clocks the uh, the mac controller and the rest of the code it goes the initializes the driver and then uh, waits until the link is up and then it goes into infinite loop and then sends the broadcast packets and receives them, right? So out of all this example, we don't need pretty much all of it. The only part that we need is the uh, in this, uh, initialization, the pin initialization. So this part. So we'll use only the uh, very, uh, you know, top part of this example, uh, which initializes the pins. Right. So here, uh, what we'll do, we, we will uh, uh, add the infinite loop with the uh, uh, with the serial log, and we will use printf for the serial log. So uh, hello from uh, uh, example, and 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 so on. So uh, for the for this, what I also want to do, I want to uh, enable Sysdict interrupt interrupt handler. So the, we will later need that for the uh, precise time tracking. So uh, let me let me add a really e a simple uh, interrupt handler. So volatile AUN sixty forty um, S sticks. So this this variable will hold the uh, current number of milliseconds. So and I'll add the sys tick. Handler, and in that handler, I'll just increment the ticks count, right? Okay, so uh, and in here, uh, just after the pin in in it, uh, I will add the sys tick config and a system core clock divided by thousand. All right, so I think. This whole thing um, makes the Sysdict working. Um, UN6040, let's add a, a quick delay until equals S sticks plus, say, 500 milliseconds. And while S sticks less than until, we just wait, do nothing. All right. So, um, and now what I want to do, I want to redirect print call to the uh, serial output. This practice is sometimes a, called a, a IO retargeting. So to do that, I need to re-implement the function called write. Uh, this function is from the C library that this SDK uses from new lib. Um, and new lib is implemented in a way that all file IO 
uh, eventually calls a set of so-called syscalls, like a low-level functions that implement the exact I.O. So all fprint, print, puchar, and so on functions eventually call underscore write. And if I uh, if I re-implement this underscore write syscall, I can basically route the output to anywhere I want, right? So let me do that. You int eight t buffer uh, and length, right? So return length and a if the file of uh, uh, the file a descriptor is one. So if it's an output, if I'm printing the output, what I'll do, I'll call the SDK. Uh, sorry, the driver function lp uh, uart uh, write blocking to lp uart1 and then buffer and length so something like that so okay let me rebuild the uh, the whole firmware it it does not uh, does not like something so until probably made uh, an error here so you in 64 until equals stx plus uh, 500 and yeah uh, I just made the mistake okay so let me rebuild it again okay so build now let me flash it so what I expect to see I expect to see this message like hello from example printed on the uh, on the on the console and I I can probably add the ticks count ticks something like this all right unsigned long yes ticks all right All right, uh, let me wait until it flashes. Okay, so we see now on the serial console, a bunch of messages, hello from example, ticks, that many ticks. So uh, now uh, what we have, we have a really, really basic example, uh, a, a really basic bare metal implementation on, on this RT1020 that simply you know prints messages every half a second and we also have uh, this piece of code above uh, 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 it, it it basically initializes the pins you art pins to print messages and ethernet pins so that's the that's everything our firmware does at the moment so and now my next steps would be to uh integrate a networking into this whole thing. So uh, I want to uh, uh, add Mongoose library uh, and a, a enable the first, second, and third layers uh, of the TCP IP stack using Mongoose library, right? So that's what I want to do. Uh, and I have Mongoose library here already, um, uh, already uh, checked out from GitHub. So let me switch to the um, to the example E9. So that's our example uh, code. And what I want to do, I want to copy uh, mongoose.c and mongoose.h into my um, into my repository here. So that's the whole integration. So I just copy two files. Here are two files, mongoose.c and mongoose.h copied, and that's the pretty much the integration. So uh, now I need to just add the mongoose.c into the build here. So let me add this, mongoose.c, uh, and I will add the uh, header include mongoose dot h into the header right so uh 
if I click on build right now, I think I'll get an error saying that I need to have mongoose custom.h. Yeah, mongoose custom.h, which is basically a file with the um, uh, with configuration of the library. So let me add that quickly. So I add a new file, mongoose custom.h. And in this file, I will just add a, a bunch of configurations for Mongoose. So uh, the architecture is a MG Arch a new lib. We also uh, enable the TCP IP to enable the second layer, the TCP IP stack. And also we want to enable the driver, the RT1020 driver. So MG enable driver RT1020. So that's what we want, right? Uh, and also we do uh, MG enable uh, custom millis for the time tracking. So I think that's all we need. And now let me rebuild the so uh, and we successfully rebuild the uh, so this is the this is the integration so right now we have mongoose source code integrated into our firmware as you can see it took like very little uh, efforts to do so now uh, what i want to do is i want to enable the whole three stacks uh, th sorry three layers of tcp ip stack on this little on this firmware right so i go here uh and before this infinite loop, uh, infinite logging loop, uh, let me enable the all three layers uh, of the TCP IP stack. So first uh, I'll enable the library layer. So I go and a, a define the uh, Mongoose event manager. So let me, uh, and let I want to uh, uh, let IntelliSense to kick in. So uh, then mg, mgr in it. So an mg uh, log set mg ll debug. So uh, these th three lines of code initialize the mongoose library. So the third layer, uh, so like HTTP, MQTT and so on. And this in this infinite loop, what we do, we disable this piece of code, and instead we do mg mgr poll, um, the event manager, and wait for one millisecond. So basically, this four lines of code, uh, we implemented the uh, third layer of the TCP IP stack, so the library layer. So, and now what I want to do. Uh, I want to implement the first two layers, the driver and the TCP IP stack, right? So to do that, I, I, I need to enable the initialize the driver. So struct mg TCP IP um, driver uh, RT1020 data. And I think it's um mdrcr24 and struct mg tcp ip interface so this is a a, a tcp ip interface and for, for the interface we need to specify a couple of things like mac address let it give two three four five six seven something like this and specify the driver so uh driver equals mongoose built-in driver tcp ip driver rt1020 and the uh, driver data equals data so something like this right and where is that here and we need to um yeah, we need to enable in, 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 uh, Ethernet interrupt and Vic enable IRQ, Enet IRQ and MG and uh, TCP IP 
init, mgr, and interface. So I think this is it. So uh, this couple of lines of code initialized the um, the TCP IP stack. So the, the other two layers. So with this code, I think we have layer one driver layer, layer two TCP IP stack layer, and layer three, the library layer working on our device. So let me rebuild it. Uh, it doesn't like something. So what exactly does it like? Oh, MG Millis. Uh, we need to implement MG Millis. So the function that does uh, time tracking, MG Millis. So uh, it just should return the current number of milliseconds since boot. So just return number of ticks. I think that's it. Okay, so uh, let me reflash this whole thing again on my device. So yeah, the LED is flashing. Let me wait until it's flashed. All right, so, okay. So what I see here is messages from Mongo's library that we have a successful network stack initialization and we acquired an IP address from DHCP. So let me ping it, ping 0 0.174. So, and I can ping, ping, ping it successfully. So basically what you see, I already implemented a TCP IP stack on this device and it works. I can ping the device, uh, but it doesn't run any application so there is no network application on this running right now so th there is nothing just the network stack so let me add a very very simple web server to this uh to this a, a firmware so it's going to be just a couple of lines of code so mg http uh listen so this is a a an API function from the Mongoose library. So I give it a manager, the URL, listening URL. So uh, 0, 0, 0, 0 on port 80. So listen on all interfaces on port 80. Uh, the event handler function and pass 0 to the event handler function. Okay, so and now I need to implement an event handler function. Void event handler. Uh, the mongoose event handler function. So this, I, I, I am implementing right now the layer number four, the last application layer of the TCP IP kind of functionality on my device. So uh, this application layer, it defines the application logic, right? So the network library gives me event when the HTTP request comes in and I need to uh, specify the functionality, how to respond. Right, so uh, let me do that. Struct mg connection c and event uh, void event data and void function data. Right, so um, in my application logic, I'm saying that if the event equals to mg event HTTP message, so if I get HTTP message in. I call uh, mg HTTP reply uh, connection uh, respond co code 200 success, no headers, and then hi from mongoose. And I say ticks, current number of ticks, this much, right? Uh, so basically, that's it. So this is my very simple web server. So what I'm saying here, when I get any HTTP request on any URL, I'm making a response high from mongoose and I show the current number of ticks. That's it. So that is my web server. Let me go and build it. So I build it and let me now flash it. So, okay, flashing on a device, waiting until this LED stops blinking. Okay, I think it did. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, did it did it flash successfully or not? I missed it. Yeah, let me reflash again. Okay, so um, reflashed, and I see the message saying, uh, uh, let me expand this, saying that, uh, yeah, MG listen on this URL. So my listener is up, and I again get the same, uh, the same address. So let me use curl utility to fetch this URL or to your URL. And I see hi from mongoose ticks that many ticks. I can use a browser, go to this 174. So this is my device. And as you can see, I refresh this page and I can see, let me increase the number. You can see I refresh this page quickly and it tells me hi from mongoose ticks that many ticks. All right. So now what I have, I have my device with a working web server that, you know, really easy to uh, uh, to expand the, that, that functionality uh, using the using the API. So I can expand this event handler function and add a lot of stuff uh, here, right? So, but what I want to do, I want to uh, demonstrate that principle that I was talking about uh, earlier, that the whole development, the UI development should be done on the workstation, not on embedded device. So what I'll do now, I will go and I will transfer the UI of the device dashboard that we saw that worked on the workstation to this embedded device. And that what we encourage you to do you know, regardless what environment you use, you may not use the Mongoose library, you can use something else, but the whole principle, uh, I think it can save you a lot of time later on if you if you implement that. So um, now what I want to do is I want to copy the uh, 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 UI implementation uh, from the workstation that we saw uh, to the embedded device. So let me do that. So I copy, uh, from Mongoose repository that I cloned recently. Uh, examples, device, dashboard. So, and there are just a couple of files. The first file is net.c, which has the backend implementation. Net.h, it contains the API of that backend implementation. And the packed fs.c, it contains the UI. Right. So uh, what I need to do is just to add those uh, files to the um, to the build. Right. So I add net.c here and also packed packed fs.c. So this is it. Oh, I think in Mongoose custom, I also need to define ng enable packed fs to one and ng enable file to zero to disable the POSIX FS. So I think this is it. So, uh, oh, uh, 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 I need to now to initialize that UI, right? So uh, include net.h and uh, in the, uh, in here. So in addition to my listener on port, uh, on port 80, I will also add the call to uh, web in it from net.h. So, uh, and that that net web in it is my dashboard. It will create another listener on, on port 8000, which will implement that fancy UI that we saw on, uh, on the workstation. So, okay, let me rebuild the firmware. So, okay, rebuild. And let me flash it. Okay, so waiting until it flashes. I don't know. Sometimes it it tells it tells me that it you know it's uh, unsuccessful. So it, it sometimes it, the IDE uh, uh, lets me uh, let me you know uh, press twice on the flash button to flash it. All right, so we have now uh, the new updated firmware, and if I refresh this uh, this page, it you know uh, it shows me the old uh, the old UI. But if I go to the port eight thousand right now, 
I can see the you know the fancy UI which I transferred from the from the dashboard. So this code right now it works on the on a device, right? So it works on a device. And as you can see, I didn't change anything. So I didn't update the, the UI code. I just copied that as is one-to-one -one from the workstation to the uh, to this uh, to this development board, right? So, and that's what we encourage you to do. So uh, as you can see, I can go now um, to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the device uh, to the workstation uh, to the uh, device dashboard example. Right? I can type make. Uh, I can even you know make some changes to this uh, uh, to this uh, uh, UI. For example, I can open um, Mongoose device. Examples device dashboard web root main.js. And I, I can make some changes to the UI. So uh, let me have this, you know, this dashboard working. So let me add a couple of changes. So I will add, you know, um, hello here at the very beginning. So you can see I have hello right now, uh, like hello from the webinar and I can see it here. So I've changed the UI. So I represent the development process right now. Okay. So, and now when I type make to rebuild the, uh, to rebuild the UI, I can go to the, to the device. I can copy the packed fs.c to the device and uh, refresh it. rebuild it and refresh it and i will see the same change reflecting on an, an embedded code as well so uh and this is you know this mechanism of like development so make your old development on the workstation not on the uh on the embedded device is what we recommend to do uh recommend you to do so now let me let me demonstrate that so I'm I'm flashing the this new update uh, on a device. Okay, let me let me wait until it flashes. Okay, it's flashed. Now I keep on refresh. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like it, it, it did not update for some reason. Maybe it, it failed to, uh, failed to recompile or to refresh. Let, let, let me do that again. But anyway, so, uh, I, I let, let it do in the, in the background. So we are, I think we are out of, of time for this webinar. So let me, uh, let me, uh, wrap it up, uh, on, on this stage. So on, on this session, I demonstrated some basic principles uh, that uh, the best practices that we collected over the years, like how to implement the web interfaces on, uh, on embedded devices, regardless of the development environment. And I demonstrated how to do it using uh, a Mongoose library uh, in, you know, in real time, basically. So, uh, and demonstrated how easy it could be. Right. Uh, and uh, so I want to give like a couple of notes, uh, the last notes that, you know, uh, uh, after this webinar, I'll share the, the slides of this webinar and some notes and references about the development. Uh, the, re uh, the notes will include the uh, references to examples, to the templates that you can use yourself to implement your own project. Um, also, I want to I want to mention is like we as a company, you can hire us to implement your your web UI on 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 your embedded device. Uh, and the last thing, but not least, is that you can book a one on one consultation, the session with me to discuss your own project. So uh, uh, in this session, it will be like no strings attached. I will not try to sell you anything, but I I, I will. Uh, uh, make sure to share everything that I know and, and uh, 
you know, all the experience that we've developed over the years with you. So uh, it probably, it could be quite useful for you if you, especially if you never, uh, uh, never been dealing with the kind of networking uh, 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 on the embedded devices before uh, or web UI. So uh, said that, uh, yeah, I will share uh, all that and including the links uh, uh, in the email that will follow. So uh, you can uh, uh, you can follow up if you want to. But now I want to jump to the questions and answers sesh, sec, section and answers answer all the questions that people asked me. So Alexander is asking, what other tools are necessary except VS Code plugin like cross compilers, libraries, board drivers? Uh, none. <laughs> you, you saw everything that is required. So the um, the plugin. Um, yeah, the plugin, it actually requires a, a, you to download the uh, the repository, the MCU Espresso SDK, right? That's one thing that you, you would need to, to do, but the plugin has an interface for that. And the second thing, it, it, it requires you to set up the path to the, uh, uh, to the uh, cross compiler, right? So you can install it using the installer, the cross compiler. Or you, if you already have a cross compiler, I, for example, I already had one, so I just set set up the path, and that's it. So that's basically two things: the uh, the uh, plugin, the uh, uh, the repository, and uh, the SDK repository, and the cross compiler. That's pretty much it. The uh, SDK, you know, the repository contains everything, like the examples, drivers, and everything. So. Uh, um, Alexander asking again, do you use Mongoose as a server for your local dev Mac workstation for the demo or Mongoose is only for NXP board for both, right? So you see Mongoose is running. So I used Mongoose on everywhere, basically. Well, we uh, also use Mongoose for our, you know, like some, some of the services that we do, like a, a like network services. Uh, we also use Mongoose for that. So uh, we use it everywhere. The cool thing about it is that it provides a, a unified API. So you can uh, you can build the code once and it will work anywhere, like on Windows and Linux, on Mac, on NXP, on ST, <laughs> everywhere. So and that's the cool thing about that. Um, so uh, another question, does this library allows you to extract data of what's happening on the MCU, like memory read variables, sometimes like live debugging? Absolutely, absolutely it does. You know, the library, uh, uh, it gets like, it gets integrated, compiled into your firmware binary. So, a, uh, so when you're writing a, an event handler for the, uh, for the library, like HTTP request handler, so when you're crafting the response to uh, to the user, uh, for example, as as I did here, you know, like here in event handler, we are crafting the response. We are saying mg http reply hi from mongoose, and I'm showing the number of ticks. Right, so you can expand that, and you can return to the user not just number of takes, any sort of guts that a you know that you want to show. Uh, you can also send data from the browser, so you can you can implement uh, like complete control over your device. You know, like read, write, memory, uh, do anything. So yeah, the question is absolutely you can you know and you can implement live debugging too. Uh, we actually did that as well. So, uh, but I, I I won't talk about this because it it it's it's a deep big topic on its own. So Alexander is asking, can serial be used as a tunnel for HTTP requests to Mongoose web server? So uh, I guess the question is here: is can you listen on the on the serial port? Right. Um, well, theoretically you can. Of course you can. Uh, but in practice, I don't really recall any you know, practical uh, example or use case that anybody uses that, right? So, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, another question, can I uh, can it be used uh, for IoT applications in automotive as well as doing flashing over the year? Yes, yes, and yes. 
uh, well, the the whole like you know, Mongoose was designed uh, for for that. It's like design goal is to be the uh, you know the enabler for the uh, IoT um, IoT firmwares. Uh, we have a aut automotive customers. A, I won't share the name, big names, right? So they use Mongoose for for various stuff, like for entertainment systems in the in the in the car and so on. So uh, another big thing is over the air updates. We are right now. Um, implementing over the air updates support directly in the library. So the same way as we uh, implemented the TCP IP stack and the drivers, we also implementing right now OTA support. So we already did it for uh, uh, several lines of ST micro. So we are continuing. So the work is in progress for uh, uh, RT uh, series for NXP and some other controllers. So, uh, so yeah, the the uh, uh, the answer is yes, uh, and you know that's one of the kind of key fo focuses that we we specialize on, because usually if you make a, a networking application, usually something like over the air update, it, it comes up you know as the next follow up problem. Alexander is asking, what are the minimum hardware requirements like minimum RAM? What's other limitations are in place? So. Uh, RAM minimum RAM is some something like around eight kilobytes. So, and I'm talking here about like the you know uh, uh, the TCP IP. Like, if you have a board with eight K, you can run Mongoose on it. Like, and with uh, uh, on on the edge, right? So you you uh, uh, but usually it you know it should be like a bit more than that. So uh, and the stack size is also something like four K. Uh, it could be like less than that. But you know, for some stable operation, if you're not talking about a TLS, uh, you should be like talking about something like 32k of RAM uh, and a four or 8k of of stack. So that's kind of like the uh, you know like stable, good kind of operating environment. But if you're talking about the minimum, it's 8k of RAM. And something like you know, uh, uh, usually like it, it it's it's a uh, combined with stack. So basically, on the microcontroller with K, eight K of RAM altogether, you can run it. So um, uh, another question: Hi, I assume that I have an STM thirty two MCU without networking capabilities, and I want to uh, a disability using Web UI with Mongoose. Is that possible with external SPI Ethernet chips? Absolutely, yes. Uh, and we have examples for that. So the best chip we found so far is a, a WizNet a W5500. Uh, so uh, if you go to Mongoose w, WS, to developers, documentation, tutorials and examples, microchip some X. So there is an example for uh, uh, this uh, little board, a uh, Sam D21 M0. So it's a Cortex M0 Plus with 32K of RAM uh, using Arduino environment and this kind of like SPI chip, right? So, but you like absolutely the same code that uses that, you know, uh, that example, you can use with, you know, with a LPC uh, micros, with, with any other micro basically. So yeah, so the, the answer to your question, Matin, yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, it's possible. So uh, you can run Mongoose with this WizNet chip on pretty much any micro with enough RAM and with SPI. And RAM, you know it. So it's like more than 8K of RAM. So you can, that means that you can run Mongoose pretty much like, yeah, anyway. Uh, another question, do you have other services like other than web server, like MQTT? Yes. Uh, uh, so the built-in protocols are a uh, web server, web client, MQTT server, MQTT client, uh, also SNTP. So syncing with the time you can send emails, though there are examples to send emails. If you go to the GitHub repository, go to examples. It, there are a lot of them, you know, a lot of examples. So you can, you know, and some some examples here are directories, right? So you can go into a directory and there are even more. So uh, 
Uh, yeah, so yeah, the, the the answer is yes. Mongoose is a Swiss army knife. It's not just a web server. It's it's a it's a networking Swiss army knife. What are the difference when using Wi-Fi network instead of Ethernet? Mongoose still provides the own network layer. Uh, uh, yes, so Mongoose can run on top of existing TCP IP stack, whatever it is, or it can provide its own drivers. Right now, we do not provide Wi-Fi network drivers for, for NXP specifically. We provide just Ethernet. Uh, but if you use, for example, environments like Azure, TOS, or, or Zephyr, uh, they're going to provide that, you know, the drivers and the network stack. So you can use Mongoose on top of, yeah, uh, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, cellular. And we have examples and tutorials for all types of connectivity. Um, another question, does this mean that you can write your backend.c instead of Node.js? Yes, that's the point. So you can write your backend in C using Mongoose. So really small implementation. So in terms of the footprint, I think uh, Mongoose, uh, uh, if you if you create a, uh, a a web server on Mongoose, its footprint is really 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 tiny. So it takes about twenty kind of kilobytes on uh, on Flash. So we are talking about a you know Cortex M7, like roughly twenty k of flash, and for each connection it takes about like few kilobytes. It's it depends, you know, it's configurable, but you know from one to several kilobytes per connection. So uh, it it has really tiny uh, tiny footprint. The other question is uh, the demonstration is utilizing bare metal implementation or, uh, or RTOS to support them. So uh, in the in the demo, I used bare metal implementation, right? But uh, absolutely the same kind of piece of code could be used in RTOS environment as well. So you just you know basically copy paste the piece of code that I put like together in this like super loop and just put it into a separate uh, uh, RTOS task. Being it, you know, like uh, Kyle RTOS or Free RTOS or Azure RTOS, whatever it is, just give this RTOS task a kind of like 8K of, of stack space. And that's it. It's going to work absolutely the same way. So, and it's going to look uh, work absolutely the same way on Linux as well. So, if you're running uh, Linux on one of those cr crossovers or Android, it's going to work absolutely the same way. No changes. I just used a, a bare metal implementation because it's kind of like the most basic one. So if you if you make something work on bare metal, you can make it work anywhere. So that's that's why I use the bare metal. So uh, uh, how can I deploy a UI done with React in this firmware? What language in the backend going to be in? So uh, yeah, so the UI you can develop it in anything, you know, in 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 React using Angular, whatever it is. You just collect a bunch of of a static UI files that you developed your UI from, and a, just convert it into a, a a C file using that utility that we have. Like we have we have a a, a step by step tutorial for that. So if you go to again to Mongoose. Uh, tutorials and examples, there is a, a device dashboard tutorial that talks about all, like every single step, uh, how to do that uh, and how to how to uh, basically uh, move the UI uh, into, like convert UI into, into a C file. So, and, and yeah, you can use any uh, any UI implementation. In our example, we used P React with Tailwind, but you can use whatever. Uh, uh, you can use like jQuery, uh, just a plain JavaScript, Angular, whatever. Any new modern uh, UI framework. So I guess that's it. Uh, I don't have any more questions left. So uh, yeah, if you, uh, oh, there is a, another question. How the web pages content interact with the hardware? Yeah, good question. So uh, so the way uh, the way it, it inter, I probably did not describe it until I kind of like had it for granted, but basically the way it works like this. So let's assume like this one, let me, uh, uh, let me bring this. So this is a web a, a a web UI. So this is a web UI console on a device on a device. So this is running on a device, right? Uh, and a, 
the way it interacts is through the um, uh, through the RESTful API calls, right? So if I open the uh, uh, the developer tools on this on this console, so this is a developer tools, right? And I uh, I refresh this page. When I refresh this page, what I see, I see that the browser downloaded a bunch of static files, like CSS files. Uh, JS files and so on, right? So it downloaded a bunch of files. So this is a static UI. And when the static UI is loaded, the UI itself makes dynamic requests. So the JavaScript code on the UI makes requests. Like for example, this is a get request that we see. Uh, you know, this is a get request. I hope you, you can see it and, and, and I can see everything. I can see the request. So uh, the JavaScript code made a request to slash API settings dot get dash get, right? And and the device responded with this, uh, with this uh, 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 JavaScript ob object like brightness, device name. And you can see it just, we, we, we Sorry, it's it's here. We've shown this as here. So brightness 57, device name, my device, log level one, and so on, right? So the interaction, so to answer the question, the interaction is done through the sequence of the uh, RESTful calls. That's why on the device side, we need to implement a RESTful interface. So uh, to... Uh, the device should implement a, a, an answer, different answers on different uh, on different URIs on on different a, different requests. So I can I can show that on the um, on the net.c file. So net.c file it implements the uh, uh, the uh, UI for this dashboard, and the key uh, the key piece of code is this. So this is the function the event handler function for the web server. And as you can see, it's a big kind of like a, a if else code. If the request is kind of API login, then request with the login data. If it's log out, request with log out. If it's the, if the URI is a stats get, you know, respond with the statistics. If it events get, respond with, you know, sequence of events and so on. So this is the way it works. Uh, I hope I answered the question. So uh, again, to reiterate, the device should implement a sequence of uh, uh, like a set of RESTful handlers. So uh, it should react on different URIs and respond with the data. So, um, and that's pretty much it. So that's why we need the web server for First is to uh, serve the uh, static content. So this piece of code serves the static content. Here we go. So, uh, and the rest of the code, uh, it serves different URIs for the restful calls. So yeah, I hope it's clear. If it's not, you you know, uh, I, I really uh, suggest to uh, either like, scan through our tutorials they they explain things in real in, in the details or again you can go and uh, schedule a, a a call a brainstorm session with me uh, i will like i'll be happy to assist anybody and i'm i'm for me it's pretty interesting interesting as well to find out what people are working uh, with uh, what's what's their environments what's the common problems uh, it it helps us to kind of tune the library to what people really need. The question: Does it support AJAX? Uh, yes, AJAX is essentially what I was explaining right now. So this piece of code is basically a, a response handlers to AJAX requests. So RESTful API and AJAX calls is are the synonym synonyms. That's the same thing. Right, so uh, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. So, um, all right, um, I guess this is it. Uh, I don't have any, any more questions. Uh, thank you so much. It was like a really, really interesting section, uh, session. A lot of questions from you. Uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, again, thanks a million. I will circulate a, a, 
a follow-up email uh, after this uh, after this call to all of you. Uh, if you have questions, you can either follow up to email or book a one 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 on one session with me. I'll be happy to assist. So again, thanks a million and have a great day. See you next time. Thank you.